And good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. And I just want to thank you for joining us today. And I think we're in for a special webinar. And uh, today, with How Kids Learn Foundation's Forum, Healing the Impact of Racial Injustice and Inequity, the role of after school with Dr. Sean Ginwright. And my name is Stu Semigran, a president and co-founder of Educare Foundation. And with me is Armando Diaz, our program director. And thank you, Armando, for the, for the tech support as we move on the day to day. And we're just glad everyone that you're here with us today. Today's webinar is sponsored by the How Kids Learn Foundation, Temesco Associates, the Educare Foundation, with support from the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation. And Temesco Associates, How Kids Learn Foundation, dedicated to improving the effectiveness of settings that support the education and healthy development of youth. And this includes schools and out of school time programs. And they do this by offering conferences, speaker forums, films, training and coaching sessions, and the awarding of digital badges to acknowledge outstanding programs. Their activities include the development and distribution of educational materials. So we're very appreciative of you joining us and the How Kids Learn Foundation, Temesco Associates, founded by Sam Pia, and thank you, Sam, and directed by Sam and Stacy Dario, for all the amazing work that they've done over the years as pioneers in the field of youth development and after-school programming. And before we begin, many of you already placed your name, where you're from, the name of your organization in the chat box. And though we're from all over the country and elsewhere, just consider we're a community of learners together. And we're coming together in this virtual forum. And uh, it's a special day. Uh, as we go through the forum this morning, as questions come up for you, I just invite you to go ahead and type them in the chat box. And then after Dr. Jen Wright's uh, presentation, we'll have a chance to come back onto those questions. And as Amanda said, the forum is being recorded and you'll be receiving a link of the recording next week. And as we start, I just want to, a couple opening comments. And I think many of us realize that we have an opportunity when we choose it to stop and put our finger on a pause button and just to look into our lives and to what's around us. And today maybe to deeply listen with our hearts as well as with our minds and a chance to reflect. There's now a huge opportunity we see I think it's in front of us for societal change. Centuries of social injustice, systemic racism, no longer being ignored, no longer being silenced. And this curtain of denial has been pulled aside. And as I was thinking of this day, I was reminded of the significance of a Mayan greeting that I often come across. And it's called in la catch, which means I am you and you are me. And if I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. And if I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. Ending systemic racism frees both the oppressed and the oppressor. So today with Dr. Ginwright, we have a chance to learn from the past and to look forward into the future with hope, to set in motion the necessary changes we need in education, in after school programs, in expanded learning. And I just wanna invite us to ask ourselves, what is it that we truly want? And how do we bring it about? And how might we best prepare ourselves, our colleagues, to redesign education, our programs, to teach, promote racial healing, social justice? And what are the best ways to step into it with each other, with our students, to have honest discussions, deeper learning? And how do we best prepare after school programs for all the changes ahead? What's our role in supporting our young people and encouraging them to engage in civic action, to become socially responsible? And how do we do it now in this remote learning style, as many of our after-school programs are being delivered virtually now? So we're fortunate to look at important questions to learn together today across what seems to be a, a virtual environment, but consider ourselves a learning community for this time today. We're due on to about an, uh, an hour and a half to about 11.30, uh, may not go that long, but we're gonna engage and involve you and invite you to be part of the conversation with questions and answers. Uh, so a little bit of introduction to Dr. Jin Wright, and then I'm gonna turn it right into his presentation. Uh, Dr. Sean Jin Wright is one of the nation's leading innovators and thought leaders on African-American youth, youth activism, and youth development. He's been a frequent contributor to past How Kid Learn Foundation conferences and blogs. Dr. Jin Wright is a professor of education at San Francisco State University. 
an Africana study department, and a senior research associate. His research examines the ways in which youth and urban communities navigate through the constraints of poverty and struggle to create equality and justice in the schools and communities. Dr. Jim Rice, the founder, CEO of Flourish Agenda, a national nonprofit consulting firm whose mission is to design strategies that unlock the power of healing and engage youth of color and adult allies. He's the author of many books and publications, including Hope and Healing in Urban Education, How Activists and Teachers Are Reclaiming Matters of the Heart, and Black Youth Rising, Activism and Radical Healing in Urban America. And that theme of healing, uh, I think we'll hear of that today from Dr. Jen Wright. He currently serves as the chairman of the board of the California Endowment, which is dedicated to improving the health of California's underserved communities. So uh, it's with great pleasure that we welcome and, and thank you so much, Dr. Jen Wright, for being with us. What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing? Um, it is an honor and pleasure to be here. Stu, thank you. Um, Armando, thank you. And Sam, I don't see you on here, but thank you. Um, and just thanks to how kids learn. Um, and and, and Stacy, if you're on, thank you um, to how kids learn for just being um, steadfast, dedicated, and a pioneer of always blazing a path for new and innovative and, and, and humane ways to support our young people. And so I just want to acknowledge uh, Temescal and Associates for, you know, been do, you've been doing this for a long time and, and, it, and it has had a transformative impact on so many youth development professionals. Um, I also want to say um, so, sort of an apology because I know this had to be canceled last time. My daughter is fine. I had an emergency uh, the last time this was scheduled. My daughter uh, is fine. She's, um, she's 19 years old and and had, we had to rush her to the hospital, but she's fine. She had an appendix issue. <laughs> so uh, we, got her, we got her squared away, but I appreciate your understanding and well wishes. Um, so there's a lot going on and I, 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 I have a PowerPoint and we're gonna go through that, uh, but I also just wanna talk to you um, because there's a lot on my mind and a lot on my heart. So I'm gonna ask you for permission for me to be human with you today. Um, I've done a lot of webinars. Um, over the since March. Um, and while I know it's important that I kind of sh share with you s sort of the theory and, and sort of the, the impact and, and sort of, and I, I'll talk about that, but, but, but I, I feel compelled today to speak with you, to speak to you from a different place. And that's my heart. And I want to say that as I reflect on where we are, um, we are a, a society that sits right in between collective trauma and collective transformation at the same time. We sit right in between it. And it is really our choices as youth development professionals, as teachers and educators, and those who care about transforming our systems where young people find themselves is to really make a choice about how we are going to lean into the possibility of a transformed society. All of the rules that we thought were impossible or difficult um, even a year ago, those rules are crumbling before us. And if we are not leaning into new ways to imagine these systems, we will inadvertently recreate them in ways that we find that we have to fix them again. So I want to encourage us to to lean into the possibility of really not doing our work in the same way, not showing up in the same way, but really thinking about our work as transformative, particularly in this time. I was on a call last month with uh, youth development professionals and executive directors of, of, of um, nonprofit organizations in San Francisco. And one of the uh, comments that resonated so strongly with me is someone said that, you know, as we, we are, whether we like it or not, we will eventually get to a post COVID world. We will be, we'll be, we'll be looking back at this. And we all have a choice to make as we move towards our post COVID world. 
And that choice is, what are we going to leave behind in the old world? And what are we going to bring with us in the new one? And if we're not wrestling with that question, if we're not thinking about that question, what am I going to leave behind? And what am I going to bring with me? If we don't wrestle with that, we will inadvertently, you know, we will inadvertently bring things into the new world that we really didn't want. And I'm not talking about just your work, y'all. I'm talking about you personally. I'm talking about your habits. I'm talking about our mindsets. I'm talking about our relationships. I'm talking about it all. Because as I'll talk about in this presentation, the mythology that somehow my professional life is divorced from my personal life, that I could better serve young people if I'm completely professional and I separate what's happening in my own healing, that's a myth and that we have to shatter that myth because we know from our own experience, we know from research and we know from the mouths of our young people that what matters most is our ability as adults to show up as full human beings, vulnerable, scary, courageous, and brave. And that somehow we're trained in ways that tell us that we have to have it all perfectly figured out uh, to show up for, for, for young people. And so I just want to say that as we move into this new world, um, for us to think about what am I going to leave behind and what am I going to bring with me? I know I've made a list. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I have a lot to say, so you guys are going to have to forgive me because I'm going to just talk, right? But one of, one of the things that I'm going to leave behind is I'm writing a book right now. And one of the chapters of that, one of the sections of that book is called How We Pivot from an addiction to frenzy to flow. And that means that oftentimes we become so addicted to busyness, the frenziness of our lives. All of us have a to-do list. Raise your hand if you have a to-do list, right? And guess what? When you, when you scratch off something on that to-do list, it's filled up with three more things. And so there's a way in which we become addicted to frenzy that we feel affirmed when we are so full of busy um, and that we believe the mythology that we're more effective when we have all these things to do. The addiction to frenzy doesn't allow us to be more humane and human with each other and with our young people. And that this addiction to frenzy is really a function of the capitalist economy that says, I value a human being by what a human being can produce or earn. And therefore, when we're busy, we believe that we matter more. We believe that we're, we're that we matter. You know, it's like, you know, you can, you can imagine yourselves being greeted by a friend that you haven't seen in a long time. And probably it goes something like this. Hey, Angela, how you doing? Armando, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing so well, but I'm so busy now. I got this to do and I got this to do. And I, I'm just so busy, right? We're, we're really um, saying underneath all that is that I matter. But we also recognize that that is not sustainable. That our addiction to frenzy actually has a eroding impact on our ability to heal and our ability to be more courageous with our young people and our, our ability to be more hum humane with each other. So me, my, what I've decided to leave behind in the old world is my addiction to frenzy being on an airplane two or three times a month, um, you know, going to meetings that I actually never wanted to go to in the first place. Um, I'm gonna make a conscious decision to have more time to spend um, in my garden, in my backyard. And so I wanna, I wanna encourage you to think about what are you gonna leave behind and what are you gonna bring into the new world because we need you and we need your souls, your hearts and your minds to show up in a different way, particularly at this time when we are experiencing profound amounts of, of social trauma. And so um, I, wanna, I wanna share with you some ideas and some thoughts about, you know, about how it is we begin to heal from our exposure to where we are as a society. To, I just wanna, it's, this is weird because I got two screens. I just wanna make sure everybody can see it. Is it full screen, Stu? Armando, does it look fine? Yeah, we're good. It's a okay. full screen. Okay. So I want to I share with you um, 
uh, my thoughts about where we are as a society and perhaps where we need to go as youth, de youth development professionals as we enter a post-COVID world. Um, but first, I want to provide a little bit of context in terms of just where we are, a um, little bit of context setting. So as I mentioned before, we are a society that is sitting smack dab in between trauma and transformation. And that the, the virus that we, that, we, that we are dealing with has forced us to really um, ch change the game of a lot of the rules that we have uh, thought were in place. And that the fact of the matter is, is that there are two viruses. COVID-19 is the new one, but racialized trauma has always been around. And COVID really has pulled the sheets off of America to reveal in its nakedness and it and in its uh its 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 brutal honesty the gross racial inequality that has already existed in our in many black and brown communities and neighborhoods on top of that we are at a point where we're witnessing uh the ongoing um uh killing and dehumanization of black young men Ahmaud Aubrey and Mr. Floyd, um, unfortunately, were not the first, but yet a string of young men and young women, black women and men who have been um, taken, lives have been taken at the hands of police officers without any repercussions. And so this is where we find ourselves. And the first virus, COVID-19 is new. The second virus, which has always been with us, is old, and that's racialized trauma. And the reason that I call it racialized trauma is that we can't presume that the way in which we experience race and the way in which we experience ra um, racial inequality, it, it is not simply blocked opportunities. There's a way that we've been taught that race, racism and racial inequality is a series of blocked opportunities. And while that is true, we know that race, racism has blocked opportunities for black folk, for, uh, for Latinx folks. But there's also, it also harms the psycho spiritual well being of those that are, affect, are affected by it. Everyone on this call, perhaps, when you, when you witnessed what happened to Mr. Floyd, you've experienced racialized trauma. You were one way before March, and after you saw that, something shifted in you. Your humanity showed up in ways that you didn't even believe were there because you recognized that a human being had just taken another human being's life. That is racialized trauma. And it is that racialized trauma that has been ongoing in Black and Brown communities. Now, unfortunately, what we've been calling trauma has been misdiagnosed. We've been given the term persistent traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term um, PTSD. And PTSD is a term that was, that was um, Stu, if, if, if my screen is not right, just say your screen isn't right. But if it looks fine, I'm gonna just keep talking. It looks kind of weird to me, but. It looks fine to you. Good. Okay, okay. So uh, we've been taught PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a term that was given to soldiers who had returned from war, that their experience from war created behaviors and psychological states making it difficult to integrate into, uh, back into society. And so we still use that term, post-traumatic stress disorder, to talk about what young people in our communities experience. But it's misdiagnosis. And it's misdiagnosis because one, there's nothing post about the experiences we experience and our young people experience. They, they may experience a trauma today and they may experience a, tra a trauma next week. And there's a persistentness of the trauma that they experience. So there's nothing post about it. And, and it is not, a disorder. 
the, the trauma that we've experienced is, is not a function of a broken person as much as it is about a broken society. And so I prefer and I encourage us all to use the proper diagnosis, which is a persistent traumatic stress environment, which means that the, way, the reason why we have disproportionate exposure to trauma is because of the laws and policies and disregard for human black, for black lives in certain neighborhoods and communities. So this means that we cannot think of trauma as simply um, happening at the individual level and that we can treat trauma with a form of one-on-one -on -one therapy because trauma is, happens in the environment. Gave the example earlier with Mr. Floyd. And so when we talk about trauma, then we have to think about it as a form of sort of social toxicity, right? And if you think about um, social toxicity, this is a piece of research by James Gabarino, who wrote a book called Raising Children in a Socially Toxic Environment. What Gabarino wants us to understand is that there are, in our environments, in our places where we work, places where we live, there are social um, phenomena that have a damaging impact on our well-being. And Gabarino says that just like there are physical toxins, just like asbestos, if you think of your breathing asbestos in where you live or lead paint in where you work, if you were breathing it in or exposed to that physical toxin, that physical toxin would eventually make you sick. And if you are not healed from your digestion of lead paint and asbestos, if you don't get treated and healed from it, that asbestos and lead paint in your body would ultimately become lethal. It could kill you. So healing from your exposure to the physical toxin is critically important for your health and well-being. Well, James Gabarino says that there's, there's this, there are social equivalents to physical toxins. And social equivalents are things like fear, anxiety, uncertainty, shame, disappointment. All of these social um, toxins, all of these phenomena are just as present in our classrooms and in our after school programs as if they are physical toxins. But sometimes they go misdiagnosed. And generally what we do when we see exposure to social toxicity show up in our schools or after school programs, we treat them with discipline and behavior modification, positive behavior, PBIS. And while it's important to understand that behavior as youth workers and those that work in after school programs, we also have to understand the root cause of what, what created the behaviors in the first place. And that's exposure to social toxicity. So if we got exposure to social toxicity, the question becomes is what do I do with it? And again, I want you to keep in mind that healing from exposure to social toxicity and removing the toxins is, in, is critically important. The second thing I wanna remind you is that these social toxins don't just attack young people. They attack everybody. They attack me, they attack you as well. That we all, have exposure to some form of social toxicity. And if we believe that somehow, um, I, don't, I, I know that they're youth development gurus on this, on this call, but, but one, of the, one of the things about youth development is it presumes that, that, this, that there's this sort of linear path from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And it perceives that, that adulthood is sort of this ultimate final product. That once we've reached adulthood, we're finished. And we know that that's not the case. That as adults, we are still healing, we're still growing, we're still learning. And if we believe we're finished growing, then we are misdiagnosing what it means to be an adult. And so we have to, we have to understand that the, that uh, youth development and adult development need to happen in tandem. 
And that oftentimes we believe because we're, we're in the helping field that we have to help young people. And we can't help young people if we are dealing with our own social toxicity. And in my work with young people here in Oakland and San Francisco, I found the most profound way that we could transform and heal young people is to engage in our own healing, is to deal with our own trauma, is to deal with our own insecurity. And guess what? When we do that, we actually are able to be more transparent, vulnerable, and human for young people. And we have a profound relationship with them. So, um, so here is um, a model that I think helps to sort of um, imagine and understand what social toxicity looks like. So this is, I like to call her Mia. Can everybody see that? So this is Mia. And Mia is a youth worker. Um, Mia wants to um, work with young people in an after school program or she wants to work, she works in a school district. But Mia also um, is affected by social toxicity. Um, and a social toxicity are like rain clouds that are raining on Mia. And, but these rain clouds are different than regular rain clouds. These, they're socially toxic rain clouds. And these socially toxic rain clouds are caused by racism, they're caused by homophobia, they're caused by patriarchy and transphobia and othering and white supremacy that ultimately rain down on Mia. And Mia doesn't even know that she's wet. So they have an impact on her, but she's not aware of it. And what happens is, is that those rain clouds have an impact, those socially toxic rain clouds have an impact at Mia at the individual level. And then they also have an impact on her relationships, the interpersonal level. And ultimately, those same rain clouds have an impact on the very institution, the school that Mia works in. And those rain clouds shape the values, the practices, and the policies of that institution, be it a school, a juvenile probation, or social work. And that institution then produces its own rain cloud or its own toxic clouds, and they go back out into society and it reproduces itself. And we have a cycle then of ongoing production and consumption of social toxicity. So this is what we're dealing with. And so our work in after school programs and our work in schools and our work as social workers is to disrupt this process, is to begin to first see the social toxicity that has an impact and then begin to heal at each of these levels. Now, here's the thing, y'all. Most of the time, we think we can fix these structural issues, this, this ecosystem of social toxicity, by focusing on only one of elements of this process. So for example, I've been asked so many times, and I'm not gonna give any names of organizations and institutions, but I've been asked so many times, Dr. Jenright, can you come in and help us do racial equity in our district and look at the policies of our institution? And I say no, because fixing the policies and the practices of the institution doesn't do anything about the people that's in the institution. An institution is nothing more than a set of relationships. And if you don't transform the relationships, guess what? The policies are just things on a piece of paper. So you have to operate at all three levels. You have to, at the individual level, we have to understand our mindsets. We have to heal ourselves. We have to understand the things that are holding us back and the things that we dream about. Like us being human matters. Once we work on ourselves, then we can begin to create and cultivate the kind of meaningful relationships in these institutions. Vulnerability, honesty, and showing up as our full human selves and not as robots in a cog machine, but really cultivating our ability to see each other and work with each other in different new ways. It is only when we begin to, a process of individual healing and interpersonal healing that we can then begin to look at the institutional healing that's necessary by transforming the policies, values, and practices. But it doesn't happen the other way around, y'all. We, we can't change the institutional policies, values, and practices and believe that somehow it's gonna transform the, the relationships with the individuals. And this is why 
I, I encourage people to think differently about um, investing in only professional development. Professional development suggests that I'm going to provide you with a set of skills necessary for, to advance your job. But you are more than just your job. You're also a human being. And so professional development also needs to go with personal development and growth, our human growth and development. And guess what? When you actually invest in our human growth and development, you actually get better job performance. You actually get a better employee when the employees feel good about themselves and are healing and, are, and feel that they're doing it on purpose. But it doesn't work the other way around. In other words, I can't, I could teach you, I could train you how to do PBIS, but that doesn't necessarily make you a better human being. Does this make sense, y'all? And so we have to begin to think differently about who we are in this process. And so transformative growth and development means that we, 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 we take parts of ourselves and our own growth seriously as a process to have greater impact with young people. So that's a, that's a way that we can begin to think about, um, think about our, the, the context that we're in. I'm going to pause just for a second because I, I, I know I've been talking a lot. Um, Stu, do you want to take a question now? Uh, maybe a couple before I, before I move. I just want to pause. Is there like, what are your thoughts about this cycle of social toxicity? Um, I know there's a lot of people on now, so if you could just chat a question or your thoughts about what I just shared, and then Stu, maybe you can read one of the questions or read one of the comments. It doesn't have to be a question or a comment. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, uh, you don't have to respond to a question. It could just be a comment. Um, but, but if you can, you know, I'll, I'll pause for just a second just to hear about what are you thinking about in terms of this social toxicity? Have you seen that in your work? Have you seen that in your after school program? So I'll just pause for just a second. Great, thank you, Dr. Ginwright. We're getting quite a few comments and I wanna take it, uh, quite a few people in terms of mentioning the importance of training us or looking at ourselves, not just the kids that we serve. And as questions are coming in, there was one that came in earlier and I wanna, and if you wanna unmute yourself, uh, Mariana at 1022, talking about how that also impacts other races, Native Americans. So Mariana uh, from BACR, if you want to unmute yourself there and ask your question, that would be great. And if not, I'll ask it for you. Mariana? I'm here, sorry. Hey. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm just having like a conflict in when I check on my values and how important it is to look at the humanity of everybody, right? And, and in the narrative that we're living right now in society, um, mainly talking about um, uh, Blacks and Latinx, but forgetting about the Native American and even white people that is living in poverty. And I understand that uh, they will be in advantage from many of us just because they're white and they are born here and et cetera, et cetera. But I think, um, I think there's a danger in the narrative we're having right now to remember the humanity of everybody and and people is not being able to talk and tolerate different points of view and and that's what I would like to help the youth to do in after schools right how do we support them to heal from the trauma but also to empower them instead of being victims great 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 question I'm going to respond um really quickly. So the first thing, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, Stu, what was the name? What was? Mariana. Mariana. I think, um, great, great comment, Mariana. And I think you're exactly right. I want to make two quick points before I move on. Um, the first question is not how we support young people with healing. That's the wrong first question. The first right question is how do I actually engage in my own healing? And, and that's because our ability to show up healing fully well has an impact on the capacity to actually guide young people through their own healing process. So that's the first thing. It's like, what do we need to, who do I need to become and what do I need to, 
to, to um, what, what, where are my growth areas and what, that, how does that actually matter in my engagement with young people? Second point, I think you're exactly right, is that, um, that these are not issues that just affect black, black and Latinx communities. They affect all communities. Social toxicity works with rural Northern whites as much as they work, have an impact on black folk in East Oakland. Um, the examples that I'm using are the examples because these are the populations that I'm most familiar with. But just last week, I was on a call in a webinar having a conversation about how you actually begin to weave human conversations so that people could see each other across difference, whether you're rural white or if you're African American and urban. And I think this is the pivotal question. And uh, in the book that I'm writing right now, in an interview, a person said, we have to learn to we have to learn that how we see the world like how we see the world is not how the world is let that sink into you how we see the world is not how the world is and if we if we get that point just that point how we see the world is not how the world is if you just let that reflect and let that sink, what that means is that how I experience the world doesn't, ma doesn't necessarily mean that's how you experience the world. And if we can actually just come to that agreement, then we can begin to have new conversations. But as long as the way that I see the world is how the world actually is, and I try to force you to see the world from my point of view, then we begin to not begin to create that circle of belonging that is necessary to actually achieve the, that, the kind of um, healing across difference, right? So thank you for that question and I'm gonna move on if that's okay. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about then the challenges with our understanding of trauma. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go past this because a little bit fast, so, um, just hang on to your seatbelts because I want to. I, I think I've been talking too much, and I want to get to some questions. So the way that we see trauma is that we generally see trauma. Um, it doesn't acknowledge that trauma is experienced collectively and not individually. And so, as a result of our thinking about trauma, we think that it is an acute act that has an impact on individuals. But you can go to any community: rural, white, urban, black, Latino. You go to the South, and you could ask young people their experience with the police, their experiences with the job market, and they will all have a similar experience. That's a collective experience. And so we have, if it's collectively experienced, we also have to think about a collective response. The second, as I already, um, already explained, is that trauma-informed uh, care doesn't necessarily see trauma as existing in the environment. It sees it in the individual. But we also, as I said before, these trauma exist in the structures and the policies and the practices of the institution, neighborhoods that we work, live, and play. And then lastly, trauma generally focuses on coping rather than healing. And that means that I will give you, as trauma-informed care focuses on reduction of negative symptomology. I will help you cope with your anger. I will give you techniques to deal with your anxiety as opposed to healing from that. And healing means that you're actually, you have an understanding of, of how, those, how those behaviors show up, but you actually heal from because you have a root cause understanding of what caused those, uh, that trauma in the first place. So healing is not just, I'm treating you, but build, building a broader political consciousness and understanding of why you're traumatized in the first place. Um, and then lastly, I wanna say that, that trauma-informed care generally has a sees treatment as from the adult to the young person. But we also need to take center our own healing in this process as well, right? So how do we do that and where are we going? And so we call this process, or I've called this process in a number of pieces that I've read, I've wrote um, called healing-centered engagement, which is a dramatic shift from, from a trauma-informed approach because healing-centered engagement um, is a it's um, a process that that al that aligns institutions with the perspective 
approach and a strategy that addresses the harm and restores well-being. And so it understands the social toxicity and the racism and the homophobia that exist in our environments. And it, prov it provides supports to institutions with shifting from discipline and harm and punishment and confinement to restoration, hope and healing. So, um, I'm sorry, you guys, my, I gotta, okay, there we go. Um, so when we talk about healing centered engagement, there's an ongoing process of restoration of our collective well-being. If we experience trauma collectively, we also have to have a collective response to it. And it's a continuous process that's based in culture, race, and identity that promotes human flourishing among individuals, relationships, and institutions. It means that we have to begin healing at all of these three levels, our individuals, our relationships, and institutions. So it is a non-clinical approach, right? Meaning that we are not seeing healing-centered engagement as a clinical approach to dealing with trauma. It's a holistic approach that says in order to actually get at the root causes of healing, we have to think about well-being at these three levels. So we have principles that we use to sort of um, to, to, to talk about and sort of understand healing-centered engagement. And there's these principles that we, that, that the first principle is that healing happens at three levels, as I shared with you before, that we have to heal, think about healing and well-being at the individual level. And that means our own biases, our own issues, our own growth and development, and the development of our young people as well. Our relationships, so that's the relationships we have as adults and our relationships with young people, as well as the institution, right? And institutions also experience trauma. I did work with the Los Angeles LAPD they, and, and then found and learned um, in an interesting way that, that police departments and institutions hold trauma, right? Without a way of dealing with it. And, and that trauma then gets, um, uh, influences the values, policies and practices of that institution. So that's the first, we have to think about trauma and healing and well-being at these three levels. So first, in order to understand healing at these three levels, there's five principles that I'm gonna share with you. The first is, we call it culture. We call this our karma model. And I can just tell you now, it's culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations. I'll say it again, karma, which stands for culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations. I'm gonna speak briefly about each of these principles as how we think about healing. The first is culture, uh, we, we use culture as a short for culture, race, and identity. And that means that in many ways, um, our, the, the way we experience harm is a function of culture, race, or identity. That means something about my identity was harmed, whether you are Native American in a school and you're, you experience racial slurs, whether you're gay or lesbian and you experience harm because of who you love, but culture, race, and identity is oftentimes the basis of how we're harmed. So culture, the first principle is we have to restore and pay attention to culture, race, and identity in our after-school programming and thinking and development. It means we have activities, we have conversations about culture, race, and identity. So for example, in our training, the first thing we say is for youth development professionals to tell their story to young people about their culture, race, and identity. What does it mean to be African-American, what does it mean to be white to, and working with youth of color? So you begin to have those conversations with young people, culture, race, and identity. Second is agency. And agency is the ability to act. And so we don't look at healing as a treatment, a therapeutic treatment. We look at agency, which is developing the ability to respond to these issues. And so what we're seeing with BLM and the movement for black lives is a form of agency in response to a collective trauma. And when people, like what happens when we march, when you marched out there on those streets, you actually began to feel a sense of power and control over a, a massive system of racism. That sense of power and control because you exercise agency contributes to your own well being. When young people, when young people respond using agency, 
that contributes to a sense of power and control. This is a body of research by Isaac Prelatinsky, University of Miami. It really gets us to understand that engagement and agency and political consciousness raising is healing. Because when we, when we engage in these activities, we build up the capacity to, to have power and control over our situations. I've already talked about relationships and they're important, but oftentimes, even in our after school programs, sometimes there are two types of relationships that we've, that there are two types of relationships and one of them sometimes we're trained in in our after school programs. The two types of relationships are transactional relationships and transformative relationships. And sometimes in our after school programming, we're trained in transactional relationships. I'm the counselor, you're the student or I'm the, you know, I'm the director and you're the parent, right? And those transactional relationships are effective, they're efficient, but they're insufficient for, for healing. And so we need to begin to think about shifting our transactional relationships to transformative relationships. Those transformative relationships are relationships that are based on aspects of our humanity. You know you have a transformative relationship when someone, um, when you can ask someone a question about their family, how is your mother? How how is your you know you can you know you have a transformative relationship when you have deep concern over their well-being. And so, transformative relationships are built on vulnerability and honesty, and transparency, and care. You know, we're not we're not. We're not oftentimes trained how to care though, right? Like in my graduate seminar and my graduate students, we talk about care, but they say, how do you train? How do you learn? How do you get trained to, to care? How do, you, how do you get trained to be vulnerable? And my response is that caring and being vulnerable, you don't have to be trained to do it. We're born with it. It's just the institutions that tell us not to do it. And so when we talk about vulnerability and honesty in our relationships, we have to learn how to um, share our stories. We have to learn how to engage in honesty with one another. We have to um, create the safety that's necessary in order for us to cultivate these transformative relationships. The next is meaning. And meaning is simply reminding ourselves about what really matters, reminding ourselves about why we got in this work. Sometimes we get in, the, as I began with the grind of the day to day, that we actually forget why we're in this. So meaning making and telling ourselves why, why this is important is an important part of our, of our ongoing work. And the last is aspirations. And aspirations is our ability to dream and imagine beyond and past the present condition. Right now in this moment that we're in with COVID and racialized trauma, it is so easy for us to look immediately, stare in the eyes at the, the massive problems that we have to solve. You know, I've been talking with superintendents and principals about how they're going to open up and what's the you know, how are they going to open up schools or not open up schools? How are you going to do distance learning? And how are you going to, you know, do after school programming online? Like, what, how do you do all that? And there's so much focus on the urgency of now, which we need to do, but we also have to focus on the possibility of tomorrow. And that means that we have to also begin to imagine. And imagination and dreaming is not just soft, easy stuff, right? Imagination and dreaming is essentially the most courageous act of justice we can engage in at this time. And that's because one of the things that oppression gives us and tells us when we are oppressed is that all we can do is think about ending oppression. That's it. So for example, the term anti-racism, which I think is important, we need to engage in anti-racism. But anti-racism doesn't actually achieve the state of being we really want. We want a state of belonging and human care and connection. 
Now we have to get there by through anti-racism and anti-blackness, but we have to be careful of defining the reality we want by the absence of what we don't. I'll say it again. We have to be careful about defining what we want by the absence of what we don't. That, that is, we can't, you know, the absence of illness doesn't constitute health. Just because you don't have, you're not sick doesn't mean you're healthy, right? The absence of violence doesn't constitute peace. And so we, when we say we want the absence of something, it doesn't mean that we are engaging in the presence of what we want. And so as youth development professionals, it's important for us to dream and imagine about the society we want, about the outcomes we want for our young people, and we have to encourage our young people to dream and imagine what kind of society do they want to birth? What kinds of activities do we think is important in our ongoing engagement? I think each one of us in our, when we do our online after-school programs in the next few weeks, that the first activities you should be doing is telling your own story about your racialized, about your experience of COVID. And then the second thing you should be doing is dreaming and imagining what's possible for this year and next year. What do we want our society to look like? That type of youth development work right now is critically important more than ever. And so as I, as I, as I sort of end uh, our, I'm, I'm gonna move past this. Um, I just wanna show, I wanna go to how we do it. In some, in some steps, and this is just a summary. Um, it, it just talks about what we might think about at the individual, inter interpersonal, and institutional level. The first is that we have to begin to one, recognize how we're affected by social toxicity and begin our own healing process. That means what are the things that we need to heal from? For example, if you need to address our own physical health, if we need to rest more, if we need to meditate, if we need to do yoga, if we need to, whatever it is, what, what do we need to do first? Do you know the, 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 when you're on an airplane, it's been a while since I've been on an airplane, but it says, in case of emergency, the mask will fall, place the mask, if you're with a child, place the mask over yourself first and then assist the child. Why does it say that? Well, it says that because if you assist the child and you don't take care of yourself, now it's much more vulnerable for that child. Well, the same practice is here, that we have to take care of ourselves first, right? That we have to attend to our own well-being. So I'm taking a lot of time here. So individual healing processes first. Then who is curious about healing-centered engagement in your work? Develop a cohort. It could be a small group of four or five or six people that really want to go deeper into these practices and then begin to build. I'm going to give you a, a website in a second where you're going to have an opportunity to get more information about activities that you could use in your own after-school programming around healing-centered engagement. And then if you're interested in changing the policies, what policies and practices exist um, in your institution, and then begin to test those policies and then ev ultimately evaluate those policies. And so um, if you're curious with, if you're curious about getting more information about healing-centered engagement activities and processes, I hope this works. Um, if you take your camera and hold it up to this image, this QR code, it'll give you um, a website where you could sign up and we will, be, uh, we will send you um, an implementation, a sample implement, implementation that gives you some, some guidelines about what to think about activities um, that you can engage in yourself as well as work with your young people. And the second thing it'll ask you is if you're interested in um, participating in healing centered engagement certification, which will be coming online, a self-paced online certification, healing centered certification that will be coming online in the fall. So if you sign up for that, we'd be happy to send it to you. Um, just want to say thank you for the opportunity, Stu, Armando, uh, and Sam, and Stacy. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here. I've been talking a long time, and I know folks probably have some questions. Well, they do, and thank you. It's been inspiring, and there's a lot of activity. And let me uh, just start by just uh, reading off one of the comments, and then there's a series of questions. And this came in a few minutes ago. Himeni, if I pronounce your uh, name correctly, uh, QH, she said something, or he's uh, something very uh, outstanding here. 
personal healing is not only an investment on ourselves, but future generations. Breaking the cycle of generational trauma is critical. And I think the work you're providing us isn't just for the here and now, you, you're having us look way into the future. And if you want to address that in terms of the greater healing that's at place right now, I think that would be helpful for many of us. Great. And there's another question that I wanted to take to, it goes along the same lines. And Ali uh, Wittenberg, if you're on the line, if you'd unmute yourself, I thought you had an excellent question about the healing process. Oh, sure. Hi. Um, Hi, Allie. Hi, thank you so much for all of your comments and insight. I really appreciate hearing from you and, um, and your, your guidance in this. I guess part of my question was to your point about how doing, um, doing this for youth and adults in tandem and what are some ways that might manifest? You know, how does that look for people that are supporting youth and doing the work themselves? How do those things work side by side? Yeah, so great question, Ali. So um, there's a way that we, again, our mindset is that we're here to help young people and that's necessary and we need to do that. But, I, but what it looks like is for us to expand that idea. That might look like, for example, when you, when you open up your after school programming, if you haven't opened up already, it might look like you're on a Zoom call and the adult begins with telling their COVID story in an honest and vulnerable way. I, you know, I was afraid because my father got sick or I was afraid because it means telling your story from a place of vulnerability and honesty and not from, you know, I'm, you know, from a place of, I am the youth developer. So my point is, is when you, when you, when you share pieces of your humanness with, with others, it gives them the permission to do the same. And when you exchange that, you be begin to cultivate those transformative relationships that we know matter in our youth development and after school programming. Now, I know that our professional training as social workers and therapists have um, rules and boundaries around disclosure and all these other things. And you'll have to decide what you believe to be uh, the boundaries of that, right? But my point is, is that if we stay only in those boundaries, that I'm gonna only engage with you in your profession, Allie, but Allie, the social worker, and I'm gonna begin our, our online after school programming summer vacation. And you're not, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're just kind of glossing over the most traumatic thing that has happened in our history of our, <laughs> our society, right? So I guess my point to you, I'm kind of blabbering here, is that I think it matters to share your story right? And, and, and be real with it, right? Just to share your story. And I think that that should be the first thing that happens in your, these are called healing circles. That's why they're called healing circles. And a healing circle means is that everybody's going to go around and say what's on their hearts. Uh, but the adult has to do it first. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I hope I answered your question. Great thank question. Would you like a, another question? Dr. Sure. Yep. Great. I want to bring it out to uh, Diana. And Diana, out of, uh, it looks like Best Self out of New York. And you had a question about communities and toxicity. So, Diana, if you're with us, if you'd open your mic and share your question, that'd be great. Oh, Stu, I don't see Diana. Oh, there she is. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Um, what I had said was that I think that all communities, um, experience tox, you know, a toxic, um, a toxic situation, regardless of where, where it is, in one way or another. And in saying that, I was wondering if I was a correct, correct in thinking that. Uh, I, I, yes. So you are correct in thinking that all communities experience some form of social toxicity. I have the the slide that I put up is an example but you can go to um, Westchester County. Are you in New York? Yes, I'm in Buffalo, New York. You're in Buffalo. So, so you can go to, um, go upstate New York and primarily white suburban communities have forms of social toxicity. Uh -huh. The fact of the matter is, is that we have to understand how those things in our society rain down on us and we are unaware of it. And so for, this is not just about for racial groups or gender groups. Uh -huh. 
right? But they have a, these social toxicity exists just like rain clouds. Um, our job, and so if you have an after school program and, you, and you're working with white, white young people or even black young people who are middle class and their families got it okay, I can guarantee you that when you have a healing circle, they're gonna have something to say about their trauma or their exposure. There's no, and that's because the society we live in, we pretend like our social class protects us uh -huh. from exposure to social toxicity. That's not the case. We all have something to heal from. It's just a how aware are we of it. Thank you. Great. That idea that it's upon all of us, we all have something to heal. In fact, we have a, a pediatrician, uh, Angela, who asked a question earlier about that healing process. And Angela, if you're with us, if you could open up your mic and, and ask your question, please, that'd be great. Hi, um, yeah, so I'm a pediatrician in Los Angeles and oftentimes we diagnose children with ADHD, um, PTSD, depression, and often these labels are very hard for families to deal with in a personal setting and then once you bring that into the school and extended community, there's a lot of stigma. And so it's, it's, it's difficult to kind of tr transform that medical community that's putting on yeah. these labels <laughs> yeah. and, and the impact that that's creating yeah. in the school system, in the justice system, et cetera. Yeah. So how, how can we- approach Great question, Angela. Uh, it's a great question. You're, you're exactly right. We're working with UCSF right now um, on how physicians, in particular pediatricians, are trained. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't go to medical school, I'm not a medical doctor, but it's my understanding from our work at UCSF is that pediatricians and medical doctors, one, don't really have a robust public health model of understanding trauma and health. It's a very medical model. I wish I had a slide, I had more time, I could you know, do the whole thing about the distinction between medical model and public health model. So that's one thing, right, is that, that, that if you, Angela, want to have a more robust, meaningful response to when some young person shows up to your, your, your office or your clinic, you have to have a broader public health model of understanding what causes harm, what causes healing. Second, Medical professionals oftentimes are not trained in issues of race and racial inequality. And so that, that's, that, that makes it even m more difficult to engage in conversations with patients about broader social and racial issues because you haven't been trained. So I hear you um, and our work hopefully at, or we're working with some uh, training folks at UCSF because we recognize that much of the, many of the tools that uh, pediatricians and physicians have, while important to diagnose really key issues, um, doesn't oftentimes provide a more holistic way of supporting families when their young people come in. Um, I think um, uh, our, 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 our new Surgeon General, um, Nadine Burke, Dr. Nadine Burke, is exploring um, these processes as well with her work on ACEs um, and understanding the relationship between the environment and its impact on stress. And so, uh, you know, for you, per for you personally, I would suggest to begin to explore and understand the broader sort of public health model so that when a patient shows up, you have more ammunition or you have more tools to talk about diagnosis as opposed to only a, a pathology driven um, diagnosis. Um, you could use a much more um, um, asset driven uh, soliogenic diagnosis. Um, or way of talking or responding to that issue. I hope I answered your question, Angela. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate your input and your insight. Thank you, Angela. Thanks for the question. And there's great comments coming through. People, Brittany saying, I'm so thankful for this training. Thank you. Uh, thank you for living the dream and setting these transformational guideposts from Susan Saltz. There's a question now, uh, and then Alvi, my biggest takeaway is transparency, healing circles without judgment, vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Focus on healing and understanding the why rather than just the coping techniques. A lot of keys are being brought in here. Um, and many, you have a question here about organizational culture shift. So if you'd open your mic and ask that question, that would be great. 
Hi, Dr. Jean Dreit. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, so I have a question about, you know, I think that making that personal commitment to do the healing work and also implementing practices is really helpful. And I also feel like organizational cultures can really either foster or impede the personal and collective healing work. So what are your thoughts on some ways to begin to shift organizational culture so that it, it really fosters healing um, more intentionally? Great question. Is it, I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your name? It's Jimena. Jimena. Great question, Jimena. Um, yeah, <laughs> really good question. Um, I want to answer that question by first saying how you don't do it. And then I want to talk about how you do do it and give you, give an example. So most of the time, organizational culture shift tries to, tries to come sort of from the bottom up from staff, from, um, you know, frontline, you know, folks that are working directly with communities. And that's important, right? Um, but it also has to come from the leadership, right? The leadership has to understand the cost associated with not shifting the culture, right? So by keeping this culture, it's actually creating more burnout. It's actually not, for, we're not able to meet our goals. So the leadership has to understand the actual cost of a climate that is not healthy. We could talk about all the costs. It could be financial costs, it could be personnel costs, it could be stress costs, whatever, but there's a cost to it. Leadership has to understand that. Um, so even from that point of view, leadership has to be on board. So how do you do it? So my uh, work with organizations begins with working with board of directors and, and senior leadership first for their own transformation. So our first thing we do is we do personal growth and development with in a professional setting. A, 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 what we do is if it's a board of directors of 10 people who've been working together and they just look at budgets and all that, well, the first thing we do is actually we, t we allow them to tell their stories, right? Who are you, where are you from? Tell me some about your grandfather. What did they have to deal with? How did you get here? What challenges did you have to overcome? What is your what? You know, and what we do is what we learn. And here's a great example. Um, the chair had been a very staunch technical person and shared with the, his board that his wife had had cancer. And they were worried about it coming back. Now, when he shared that, he had never shared that with his board before. When he shared that, everybody immediately had a sense of empathy and connection with the board chair that they hadn't had before. They saw him as a human being. And then they shared stuff. I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my house. You know, my, 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 my grandmama's sick. Or they just start talking about real human stuff. Now, once we are able to do that, have that conversation, right? We can, they see each other in different ways. And now we see each other in different ways. The question is, is how would you like this this, how we feel right now with each other to actually permeate throughout your entire organization, right? So I hope I'm answering your question, um, but it begins with, um, you know, with the senior leadership. We're doing some work now in another city um, where we're doing that with 12 organizational leaders that, um, <laughs> that don't get along, <laughs> right? Um, they all serve young people, but they all butt heads. And so we're, we're working with this group right now on some of these practices. And it has shifted. We thought we could shift it in six months, and it's been a year. <laughs> and so it's taken a lot of a lot of emotional work to do that. I hope I answered your question uh, with the, with an example. Good question. Great. Thank you, Jimena. There's a question coming in from Terrence Cauley out of St. Louis uh, that I think has interest for many. So Terrence, if you're there, if you open up your mic, love to hear your question. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Sean. Uh, I've been a fan of your work for quite some time now, so it's good to actually uh, be in a, a part of a, a piece with you. Uh, my, my question was about um, this, this notion of uh, toxic charity and, mm. and its impact um, in communities of color um, and, and how it may contribute to these notions of trauma that you're talking about here? And, and, and do you have any thoughts around, you know, how to, to I guess, uh, 
sort of prevent that kind of thing from happening? Yeah, thanks for your question, Terrence. And I assume that you, what you mean by toxic charity is this idea that I am, my role as a youth development professional is the savior. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, I, 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 okay, so here's what I got to say about that. Um, there are so many movies, um, I can't even name all of them, that have this sort of theme about, um, what's the one where he's a writer, this kid's a writer, he's a black kid, he's a writer, and he's Sean Connery. And Yeah, it actually happens to be one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, it's a great movie, but it's the yeah. same theme, yeah. you know, Dangerous Minds, right? Yeah. The same theme that permeates Hollywood's thinking about young people, which I think you're meaning toxic charity, which is I, I, my role is to save these kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you're a youth development worker and you are white, or if you're a youth development worker and you are male and you're working with young uh, girls or young women, if you are straight and you're working with gay young people, my point is, if you are working with young people and you haven't interrogated your identity, then in some ways you are um, promoting this sort of toxic charity idea because you're entering it as a savior. And that, one, young people could smell it and sniff it, you know, they could smell it and sniff that miles away. And two, it prevents for authentic relationship, right? And so it's really important for every youth worker to interrogate their identity. That means you're, in, you're asking yourself, what does it mean? Why do I feel uncomfortable? Why do I feel confident? What is my old goal here? It's a series of just ongoing questions about who you are engaging in this work. And if we don't engage it, it will engage us. <laughs> you won't be effective in doing it. We cannot pretend that our identities don't matter. And there's this sort of, well, we're all human. Yeah, we're all human. But our identities matter. It means that um, I tr when I do training around youth development, I want, I don't, I want every young per per uh, youth worker in an after-school program to see black kids as black. You're black. Not as I, not as, but black in my mind is an asset. That's a piece of identity, right? And I want white um, youth workers to see and acknowledge and understand that. Um, that means in order for a white youth worker to do that, they have to understand that they're white, right? And what that means. So Terrence, I'm, I'm kind of just rambling. I hope that makes sense. But this notion of toxic charity means that we have to really get underneath the hood about our motivations and our expectations. The second principle in the, the healing centered model was agency. And that agency is at the opposite end of the continuum of charity. And agency means is how can I actually engage with you in ways that create power for us to respond to anything that comes at us. And charity is at the opposite end of that continuum. So that, that term agency is there for a purpose, to avoid charity kinds of work. Yes, sir. Thank you. That was perfect. Well, thank you, Terrence. I think Thanks, that for many to hear, so appreciate it. Dr. Ginwright, do you have time for another question coming in? Sure, here? yeah. Okay. Let me just kind of look at it. Okay, here's, uh, uh, just came through. C.E. Uh, C. Hill uh, about telling the story. C.E., would you open your mic and share your question? And if you're not, I'll share it for you. C.A. Hill. Okay, her question is this. I feel most youth do have understanding at different levels um, to the clouds. And after we investigate ourselves and tell our story, what's next? Mm -hmm. As we become right. that authentic, how do we then take it from there? Well, so relationship, transformative relationship building isn't a destination, it's a journey, right? It's ongoing. So, you know, it's, it's not like, a, and, I, and I don't know if this is what you're meaning, uh, CE Hill, about what's next, like what's the next step, but 
the, the, the purpose of our telling the story is to give permission for others to do the same. Young people are gonna model what we do. It's just oftentimes we are not, we don't have the sense of, we haven't created the safety container for us to do that. So let me give you a couple of things. One, you have to create safety. We don't create safety by rules, right? We got, you know how you do it before a workshop. What are our guide rules? You know, we, you know, one mic and all these, right? Yeah, that's fine, but that doesn't really create safety. What really, really creates safety is when you put your emotions on the line, is when you actually put your vulnerability on the line, when you actually cry, or when you actually say what's going on with you. When young people can see and feel that, right? That's what's gonna create the safety. I work with thousands of young people and every time that happens, it makes a difference, right? So that's one thing. And so when telling your story is not just telling your story, telling your story is like, I wanna be, I wanna, I wanna go, I wanna go somewhere with you right now. Just like I opened up, I just wanna talk to y'all, right? I could go through the PowerPoint like your graduate students, but I kind of just want to talk. And so um, opening what I'm, so telling your story, that's not just telling your story. It means that you're willing to be vulnerable and open. Next, have them do the same. What are you afraid of? What are you most hopeful for this year? What is the, what is something that you wish never happened in your life? Right? You might want to answer that question first. What is your biggest regret? What is your, greatest dream, right? These get at the human condition. So after you share that, then have other people share it, right? Um, and it might feel awkward at first. Um, you do want to have some safety, right? You, you have to say this is going to be a safe space. And you have to be as trained facilitator if you feel that it's not safe, then we can, you know, move on to something else. But creating the safety is important. My sense is, is that when you do that ongoing, you do it over and over again, you begin to create the culture of safety and, 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 and transformative relationships. Um, so in the guide that you will look at when you'll get it on there, there's steps that, you know, that's, that's on relationships, but there's a number of other activities that you can actually use to have conversations about culture and agency and relationships as well. Stu, you're, I think you're on Go mute. Go ahead and mute yourself, Stu. <laughs> there we go. I just want to thank you, C, for that question, Dr. Jinwright. I'm aware of our time, and I wanted to give you time for any kind of closing thoughts, closing uh, reflections, and then we're going to have some uh, announcements towards the end. So, great. Back, John. Yeah. So, uh, one, just again, thanks uh, to uh, How Kids Learn. Um, your uh, the ongoing thought leadership in this in this space is is critically important. Um, I always learn when I when I, when I uh, watch and hear uh, folks from How Kids Learn. So it's an honor to be able to share these ideas with you. Second, um, I, I do want to push and encourage you to think about that question that I began with is, what are you gonna leave behind and what are you gonna bring with you? It's a personal question. And just think about that and really try to make a commitment to bringing something into the new world that you know will make a difference. Um, Again, I want to encourage you, if you haven't, um, hopefully you were able to um, sign up on uh, the, um, the toolkit. Um, and uh, if you're interested in the Healing Center and Engagement um, certification program that will be coming online, um, that would be great. Uh, but I just want to say again, thanks for the opportunity and um, uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, Sean. And uh, I think from what I'm reading and just from the energy of people's comments, there's just so much that uh, people are taking from what you're saying today. And I think it rings a chord. I know for me, uh, the words about dreaming past the COVID, about what do we want to create, uh, that we can go there and we need to go there in our imagination to plan and, and that it's more than just the actions we're doing to get through, it's where we're going. And we have to create that picture of where we're going. And I think you just, planted that for us so well today. I want to give thanks to you for being with us. And I want to give thanks over to, of course, Sam, Pia, and the How Kids Learn Foundation, to Mesco Associates, SD Bechtel Foundation, for everyone for coming on today, to you know, making your time available. And hopefully this then propels each of us of how we move forward with this. Uh, big thanks to you, Armando Diaz from Educare, our program director for doing the tech side here. And um, 
I want to let you know, and this is coming from Temescal, that these type of webinars are ongoing. There'll be more coming up throughout the school year. Next month, Educare has been invited, and I thank you, Sam, for that, on September 16th for a webinar called Heartset Education, a compassionate model for culture change. A lot along these lines of building that organizational, but coming through the individual transformation into one of caring and kindness. And we'll be presenting, and I'm uh, happy to be presenting on that one, September 16th. And uh, how kids learn to learn more about it, to offer your feedback, your thoughts, please get in touch with them. And you can see on the screen here, their website for how kids learn in Temesco. And they'll soon be sending out a link to each of us with the recording for today's forum and all the additional resources that were tied into it. So in closing for today, I just want to again, thank you, Dr. Jen Wright for being with us, how kids learn for hosting this and each of us to go out with uh, the inspiration and the willingness just to make a difference in the great ways we're doing that. So thanks for enjoying and have a great weekend ahead and take great care, everyone. Thank you for being with us.